Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Everyone who's present, anyone who might be watching on YouTube, extended friends and family of Mia's, Mia Jacobs, who might be observing from a distance, and also members of the Beth Am community and family who are not here in person but are watching digitally. These words that I'm going to share with you began as an email I was going to send out that were processing the immediacy of this last week's events in American society. And they evolved into a longer musing on justice itself that I thought would be better suited for a Shabbat Dvar Torah than an email. And I'm going to start not only with a caveat, but a caveat to the caveat. The caveat to the caveat is that the caveat ought to be implied, of course, and perhaps not needed to be said, but I'm going to articulate it anyway. And here's the caveat. If you're listening to this, expecting to hear an exact facsimile of what you would have written or a mirroring of your exact thinking and feeling on this subject, you will almost certainly be disappointed. I write this and I share this not to convert you, but to share a piece of me reflected and refracted through our timeless tradition. And I always remain open to dialogue and learning from you what in these words resonated or offended, what pushed you to think differently or reinforced your own biases, what confirmed that we are aligned in our thinking a bit, or what cemented how differently we approach these issues. But mostly I invite you to listen to these words with curiosity, not hoping that they will satisfy you entirely. I didn't, and I never write towards that purpose. With full understanding of how weighty and intense and relevant this phrase is, I invite us all to take a deep breath, literally and figuratively, to take that deep breath just a few days after an equally weighty verdict was brought down from our judicial system, bringing some semblance of justice for the tragic death of George Floyd, and also sparing parts of our society from deeper convulsions that likely would have gripped us and perhaps even threatened us had there been a different outcome. There's nothing to say today, and there's everything to say today. There's nothing to say because the law has spoken and all else is commentary. And there's everything to say today because our society remains deeply torn and far from its promise of offering an equal chance at life and liberty and happiness to all. And until we reach that aspirational point, we must keep pursuing that sacred goal with word and with deed and unified purpose, even as we remain decidedly disunified in strategy and even in aspects of the goal itself which is what makes this so very hard. I found myself this week in the highly unusual place of agreeing with, and now even quoting, Reverend Al Sharpton, much of whose public persona and impact I find odious. After Derek Chauvin's guilty verdict was announced, Sharpton said, we don't celebrate a man going to jail. Indeed, this is a moment for sobriety, not triumphalism. A moment for justice's intentionally muted victory, directing us towards society's future maturation and evolution. He continued, we'd rather George be alive. Again, I could not agree with him more. A 
sense of tragedy still hovers, first and foremost for the family of George Floyd. They remain bereft and mourning and forever robbed of the life Mr. Floyd could and should have continued to live. And there is tragedy hovering, perhaps even looming, for communities of color who wonder when unwarranted and irreversible violence will visit them, a version, a version of Exodus's angel of death that does indeed pass over certain Americans' lintels more reliably than others. And I will add, there is tragedy hovering for the family of Derek Chauvin, he is guilty of murder. That has been decided. And I'd like to think we all agree that he did not get up on the morning of May 25th, 2020, my birthday, by the way, motivated by enmity for black people with the intent to end a person's life and ultimately lose his marriage and his freedom. He sits in solitary confinement today beginning to pay his debt to society, and that is a terrible thing, even if it is a just thing. Now, as a rabbi, as always, I try to process reality and understand the past and navigate through the present and anticipate and work towards a brighter future through our timeless text, the Torah. And somehow its illumination finds a way to be more grand and more relevant and more immediate rather than more muted the farther we get from the Sinai revelation. And this week is no exception. Within the verses aimed at crafting a sacred and elevated society that we read in Kedoshim, the second of our two parashot this week, we find the following words by Yikra chapter 19 verse 15. Lo ta'asu avel ba mishpat, lo tisaf neidal, velo tedar pnei gadol, betzedek tishpot amitecha. We could spend a semester trying to render that one line of rather simple Hebrew vocabulary into the most accurate contemporary English. Each phrase is loaded. But let's offer this as a pretty good translation. Do not execute perverseness within judgment. Do not raise up, or maybe it's better to say turn to the face of the poor, nor show deference to the face of the rich. Rather, judge your fellow fairly or righteously. And again, each phrase is dripping with multiple possible meanings. Some might argue that those being addressed in this verse, whether it be judges per se, or the society within which those judges operate, are primarily being admonished neither to favor the vulnerable beyond the facts of the case, nor refrain from holding the powerful responsible. Both aspects of that verse, then, seem powerfully relevant this week. As a rabbi and as a citizen and as one who wants to continue to have trust in an imperfect judicial system, I am moved by the notion that those who wield power and wield weaponry in our society can and must and have been called to task when they err, and called to task dramatically and in a life-altering way, if in a way they err dramatically and in a life-altering or life-ending way. And I remain equally moved that the Torah's call for this manner of justice was, I hope, played out in that courtroom in Minnesota, though I fear it was not sufficiently so in the court of public opinion where the verdict was decided long ago. I know some disagree, but I do not believe that we just witnessed a show trial, which is the mark of a freedomless society, nor one whose verdict was inevitable, 
even if authority figures and groups more than mildly threatening mob violence suggested that there could only be one outcome. This was a trial in which the accused was granted the most vigorous defense possible, which is also a hallmark of the American and biblical judicial system. Arriving at mishpat, the sentence, with tzedek, justice or righteousness, requires both that the gadol, the powerful ones, are not spared the rule of law, and that the dao, the impoverished or vulnerable, emerge only with an outcome specifically due them in that case. And again, I both hope and believe that the murder trial we just witnessed satisfied both criteria and sets a standard for similar circumstances which we all tragically know will inevitably intrude upon our headlines and our consciousnesses sooner rather than later. A teaching by Rabbi Yehuda Eger, who was a 19th century sage in Lublin in Poland, on this verse sharpens the point. He believes the opening words demanding that we not tolerate perversions or maybe twistedness, avail, and judgment remind us that all people are capable of avail or perverse deeds. He writes, there's no tzaddik, no righteous one who does not sin. And he goes on to say that it is proper for the individual to repair what is lacking in one's soul through regret through tshuva and repentance, but it is wicked and perverse, he says, to try to repair a righteous person's sinfulness by searching for ways to justify it. That repairs nothing. It just perpetuates and amplifies what is broken. For a person to say, or for society to say, on behalf of a person, that something indefensible was actually defensible, itself perverts justice, and thus is an example of tolerating and even insinuating a veil within mishpat. It pulls the wool over justice and thus upends the notion of justice itself. And powerfully, this notion applies both to an accused person attempting to justify unjustifiable behavior, and it also applies to a prosecution team, perhaps, that might itself pervert specific justice in one case in order to reach a wider societal achievement which renders any accused a scapegoat. There are elements of our judicial system which invite such perversions on both sides of the law. Every accused does deserve a rigorous and vigorous defense part of which will necessarily involve an attempt to justify or contextualize that which is truly beyond contextualization. Every time. And every prosecution is aiming for a conviction. Whether the specifics of the case are undeniably strong or circumstantial. Whether the case mostly stands on its own merits or is buffeted by powerful cultural symbolism, thus putting more weight upon the likelihood of a particular outcome. Torah wisdom adjures all of us, both within the courtroom and beyond, to resist such urges, or at least excesses among such urges. Torah wisdom commands us not to allow justice to be perverted by anything other than what is true and real in any given case or moment. I'd like to believe that though the Derek Chauvin trial was tried under American law and Minnesota state law, its process and outcome were triumphs by both civic and secular standards and also the biblical standard that our Parsha lays out. We are tiptoeing forward towards and yet still painfully far from so many lofty notions of the American society. A society I still consider to be one of the freest and most just in human history. We remain guilty, all of us, 
in continuing to withhold our unperverted commitment to Dr. King's vision that his children and his people would be judged only by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And I'm rather certain that in that transcendent line from his I Have a Dream speech, he was referring to all Americans, regardless of their race. He was asking that the George Floyds of the world and the Derek Chauvins of the world be judged by deed, not by race. Dr. King, too, in his own way, was asking that we neither cower from the privileged nor overly favor those less so. And as we tiptoe, we also march. And we at Betham recommit to yet more and yet more challenging sacred work towards making our community and our building and our shul and our school a place truly open to and truly embracing of and truly uplifting for any and every seeker who walks through our gates irrespective of race, gender, sexual identity, or political affiliation. And maybe even more importantly, we at Beth Am recommit to yet more and yet more challenging sacred work towards righting the wrongs and balancing the inequities and out-loving the hatred and reversing the trends of racism that fester just outside our gates and penetrate our neighborhoods and infect our city and keep our country from its most noble manifestation. This week's news will always be momentous in retrospect, but its immediacy will wane. Our commitment to true justice must never do so. It must continue to grow. The Torah demands it. Shabbat Shalom.